Got it. All righty. Let's officially call the meeting to order. Uh, the first uh, comment is if there is a member of the public, could you identify yourself? Yo. Anyone. No. Okay. Claudia, I don't recognize your name. Claudia is the HR manager, Frank. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So let's start with a uh, approval of the meetings from June 17. Has everyone had a chance to review it? And if so, can I have a, uh, any discussion? No? A motion to approve the minutes of June 17, please? Move, move to approve. Okay, Paul, a second. A second. Alex, okay, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 So approved. Moving on. Um, who is ASUS Zenpad Z8? Uh, that could be the interim problem. Did you I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. No, I felt I feel like Claudia was trying to chime in on your question. Okay, Claudia, can you raise your volume? Hello. I think Claudia, Claudia's on mute right now, muffled. but I, I thought I picked up that she said that was her, maybe her uh, laptop. Oh, okay. All right, then we'll start off with Chris Monroe. And Chris, can you give us the update on medical? You're on mute, Chris. There you go. Uh, let me just throw up my exhibit. And let me know when you can see that. Can see it. Sure. Well, the uh, agenda for me tonight is pretty straightforward. I um, wanted to share with everybody where we are year to date. Also wanted to give everybody a little bit of feedback in terms of the transition to Cigna. I know we had talked about it um, right as we were breaking for the summer. And, but just want to give everybody a little bit of an update on where we are um, since we made that move over to Cigna on the medical side and RX benefits on the pharmacy side. Um, but before we get there, let me start with the monthly claim report. Um, a couple of things when it comes to how this report has changed. Um, in prior years, um, we were simply sourcing all of our claims from Blue Cross. So whether it is medical or pharmacy or dental, um, we were relying exclusively on Blue Cross to share with us claims that have evolved in any given month. Um, now we're operating in a little bit of a different environment. We're sourcing our claim data from three different sources. Um, we've got medical runouts from, uh, from Anthem. So although we ended our relationship with them in July, we still have them paying claims on those services that were incurred prior to July but reported for payment after. As we add additional months, the claim totals will come down and down and down from that perspective. We'll still have some lingering claims with them on the medical for our over 65 plan, but for the most part, we'll see those claim amounts get smaller and smaller as we get deeper into the plan year. Um, we also have our new incurals under Cigna. So obviously Cigna being the carrier on the medical side, we'll start to see claims build in that column as we add future months. Um, we also now have separate pharmacy relationship and we'll continue to see pharmacy claims build in that bucket. One note on the pharmacy piece, we don't get claim reporting from RX benefits until the end of the month so I won't have September totals until early next week. And that puts us beyond when we traditionally meet as a committee. You'll see that I bolded in red an estimate of what I think the claims could be. Hey folks, they could be 180, they could be 190, they could be 250, but we do need some placeholder there whenever hey, we meet. Yep. 
Could you could you just advance to that page? We're still seeing your cover. Oh, that's not good. Uh, hold on here, Mike. Sorry about that. Looks like you're running a. Yeah, how's you that got better? It. You got it. You got it. So as you can see, I'll just have some claims there as a placeholder. And then I'm obviously picking up my dental claims. But instead of, again, sourcing from one carrier, we're now sourcing from a couple of different carriers when it comes to the data that we use to feed the report. Right. Um, when you look at where we are year to date, um, we're off to a good start. Um, claims relative to budget are running at a favorable level. Um, recognizing we do have a little bit of claim immaturity in July, um, we'll continue to see that build as we add future months. But at this point in time, when you look at all of our moving pieces from a cost standpoint, um, we are sitting on a nice surplus year to date. I'm making sure that I pull in our administrative expenses. I'm making sure I pull in our claims. I'm making sure I offset those amounts against any credits that we might get in a given month. And when you look at what comes out the backside, you're finding that we're in a nice position year to date. Um, let me stop here and see if you have any questions in terms of what I've touched upon so far. Good to go. Okay. Um, again, with, with three months under our belt, obviously future months, this report becomes a little bit more meaningful. Um, in addition to measuring where we are year to date, we also like to make sure that we isolate certain components. One of the things that we always look at is large claims. Um, a large claim is characterized as any claim over 50,000. Um, we've been very fortunate in the first three months where the sole claim in excess of 50000 is one individual who came in at $75,000 in total spend. Now, again, I expect this number to change as we get deeper in the year. This is clearly contributing to why we're off to a good start. We just haven't seen too many large claims materialize. Again, when you look at our history, our large claim outlays have improved over the years, but you're still gonna see a healthy amount of large claims once we get to that five, six, seven, eight month mark. But you know, be that as it may, we're in good shape relative to the start of the year. What we try to do too is look at more than just open policy year results. In this case, we're tying them back to historically how we fared from a large claim standpoint. Um, again, we're off to an exceedingly good start, but caution being what it is, we will definitely evolve back to some of those normative numbers in future months. This again shows where we are against our static budget. Um, what we typically do is we look at the number of employees at the start of our year and we set a static budget around that. And then we just simply back off that, what we've spent in costs. So we look at what that budget was based upon the enrollment when we locked down our budget. We look at it on a prorated basis, in this case through September. And then folks were simply pulling off of that number. What did we pay in claims? What did we pay in administrative fees? What did we get in any type of rebate um, or any type of credit that populated on the account to come up with kind of a de facto margin or deficit position? This is where we look at things on a per capita. Um, you know, are we running in line with prior years? Are we up? Are we down? You know, where are we relative to what our normative expectations are? This also gives us the ability to track enrollment changes over the year, and we come up with a per capita. 
Um, you know, the, the, the message that emerges when you look at this slide is we are very much on a roller coaster. Um, we're up, we're break even, we're down, we're up, we're break even, we're down, we're up. Um, this year, again, I wouldn't expect us to generate claims 18, 19% below last year. Um, we will start to even out. Um, but at this point, again, we're in good shape relative to the start of the year. Chris, uh, this is Paul Mead. Uh, remind me again, did the $414,000 in July, was that the result of a, a, a credit from the previous, previous year? No, what, what, what that was really based upon is it's not uncommon for a carrier, Paul, to hold claims in the first month. You know, claims come in, they'll hold them, they'll test their system to make sure that it's working before they officially release those claims for processing. That 414,000 is really our Blue Cross runouts, our dental claims with Blue Cross, the pharmacy claims, and really nothing on the Cigna medical side. You'll start to see Cigna, as they did in August and September, They'll continue to release those claims for processing. Providers will get those checks. They'll cash them, and you'll you'll start to see claims flow in. So that's really simply a byproduct. In this case, a signal holding claims for the month of July. And would they hold them for uh, several months, or would that be uh, that have caught up by now? Yeah, will in essence be caught up. I would argue in the next month or two. You know, so the claims sent out into July, you know, could be sitting in a provider's office, you know, getting ready to, uh, you know, be cashed and cleared. You're not going to see a lot of that. But again, we, in essence, should be caught up. There might be some incremental flow into October, November. But, you know, by the time we get through those months, we're essentially going to be caught up. All right. So those months look pretty, pretty good. And that's legit. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, okay. August and September are legit. Okay, thank you. Chris, I have a, a question. For the year 2020, um, it doesn't seem that COVID had an extreme effect on the number. Um, March and April are a little high, but they're also months that are high similar to that in 2019. So am I, am I, yeah. I don't see that COVID really had a serious effect on it. Yep, no, by the time we got to, you know, I think COVID, Claudia really shows itself in the 2019 column because that would be July of 19 through June of 20. Look at March, April, May, and June. Those are your COVID months right there. You know, you look at $600,000 in April. You know, it was a million dollars in May, but then dropping to 244 in June. Um, that was a little bit of funkiness on Blue Cross's part. But by the time we got to 2020, you know, July, August, you didn't really see any softness a little bit in August of 20, um, a little bit you could argue in October, but for the most part, um, everything kind of nine out of those 10 months kind of really reflected what our true liability was. Thank you, Chris. But any questions in terms of this report and how things are sizing up? Hey, Chris. Just looking at your at the head count there, um, going from 541 down to 508. Just want to probably point out, I'm sure that's because of the police, correct? Correct, correct, correct. Police are in the state partnership plan. They they uh, protested the the move to Cigna. Yeah. yeah, we moved 41 officers off. So you know those 41 coming off, you had a few people coming on. But the, the, the net effect is a loss of around 30, 30 something or so people off the plan. Hey, any other questions for Chris? No? Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Let me just make one final comment. Um, 
you know, we are almost four months into our relationship with Cigna and RX benefits. Um, we continue to meet every Tuesday with Cigna and generally every other Tuesday with RX benefits just to make sure we have a handle on things. Um, you know, we still get employee inquiries about, hey, why was the claim paid this way? Is it processed correctly? You know, the one thing I had made uh, in terms of a statement is we continue to be open for business, if you will, when employees have issues. So whether it's a board of ed or a town employee, if they have an issue, you know, we encourage them to bring it to our attention. To my knowledge, we have not run across one instance where Cigna has not processed a claim or covered a claim if proof emerged that that claim was covered by Blue Cross. So, you know, again, when you look at what we expected to happen and what we hoped and um, would happen, I think uh, everything has come to fruition. Um, we're not seeing a whole host of people saying, hey, this was not processed correctly. Again, we continue to field questions, but we're not seeing any systemic issues around the migration and the move to Cigna. You know, we do have people who said, well, I like things better under Anthem. Um, I get that. Nobody likes the change, but by and large, I think it's been a pretty successful move over to Cigna. Um, the only pain points that we continue to have, folks, um, continues to be on our over 65 retiree program that is with Blue Cross. Um, we have a lot of retirees who are waiting on reimbursement, a lot of retirees who continue to call into Blue Cross. They'll call in on a Monday, they'll call back on Wednesday and get two different answers. I think we've made progress with the right people at Blue Cross in on those issues now, but we still have a long way to go to get back to historically um, how Blue Cross performed on the over 65 plan. But the, the pain points aren't with Cigna or RX benefits, the pain points are with Blue Cross, unfortunately. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And moving on to Chris Porter. Folks, I'm going to uh, say goodbye. Uh, I have an appointment I have to get to, but I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to go first. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Thanks Chris. everybody. Chris Porter, you're up. Well, thank you, Chairman. Well, first off, it's great seeing everyone uh, at some point. I'm, I'm kind of feeling like you never know. Maybe it'll be in person. But if it was today, it would have been in the parking lot outside, right? But um, seriously, uh, I missed you last month uh, due to my daughter's wedding. And, and yet at the same time, I know you were in good hands. So what I wanted to focus on are really two main areas. One of them is obviously an update on some of the activities that are going on that fall into that risk management bucket. Uh, as you know, on the property casualty and risk management side, we never sleep. The town never sleeps. The school district never sleeps. So there's always something going on. And I guess I'm kind of thinking about Claudia, probably every day something's going on and uh, you know where HR kind of crosses over into risk management. The second item, I just wanna give you another um, kind of update on what we're seeing with the marketplace. And I think that's relevant because we are now making our way into budget season. So first and foremost, just activities. Uh, you know, USI is continuing to help educate our clients. It can be, you know, off the cuff, you know, inquiries on a different, you know, level of risk management items that hit, you know, different types of activities that the towns and the school districts have. Um, but we also have different webinars on a variety of subjects. What we're going to be doing uh, later on this fall is setting up a claim review session. We've done these several times. I think I've spoken about that to you. But the whole idea is to shortlist the larger dollar liability claims, as well as workers' compensation claims, get the adjusters from Kerma on the call to talk to the latest status from their perspective and then get the latest status from the perspective of the town and the school district. And that sharing of information helps to refine both the reserves, the dollar reserves that are out there, but also more importantly, refines the strategy 
to work to get these claims closed. Uh, we wanna make sure the employees are treated properly, um, no pun intended there, uh, with, with uh, the medical side of things, but it's ultra important before we really hit the peak part of the budget season after January 1st, that we validate the dollar reserves because all of this is what gets looked at by the insurance company underwriters and we wanna make sure that that's done. So that's an important part. Uh, Claudia, I remember uh, one, two months ago, you said, hey, let's get together in early December and um, it's on my calendar. So uh, you'll be hearing from us as we begin to match the uh, calendars on that one. Another Perfect. one is uh, looking at literally the claim reports that come out. Uh, Kerma has made some changes to their claim system and the type of reports uh, that come out, they're still working along those lines. So we've been working on behalf of the 20 plus clients we have that are with Kerma to work with Kerma to get the format of those reports changed because we wanna make sure that uh, what Matt gets, what Claudia gets and what Mike gets is easily reviewed. It's a dashboard view when we look at that. So that's something happening behind the scenes. Uh, another one, and this relates to the, the budget, um, our approach to helping Matt and Mike with the insurance budget, it's not just to throw out a percentage premium change. That is only one facet of an insurance budget. What we like to do is first get a feeling for how are your carriers doing financially? And to give an example, I've had conversations um, with the underwriting officer at Kerma, and they did do very well during the COVID era. Um, the amount of workers' comp claims was suppressed. Uh, the dollar value was suppressed, probably reducing the claim dollars by millions of dollars. Uh, but also, not just on workers' comp, but also on the liability side, there seemed to be a little bit less activity. The amount of lawsuits you know, across the membership for Kerma was down. So what does this mean? What it means is the town currently has a rate cap agreement in place for the current year, but it also has, and this is something we supported about two years ago, there's a rate cap for the property liability package policy of plus 3% maximum for the July 1st, 22 to 23 year. And based on overall market conditions, especially knowing we have you know, law enforcement statute changes, a lot of pressure with very large claims across the industry, this is a great starting point. It's great to have some assurance that that line item isn't going to go over that in terms of rate change. Obviously our goal is to see that we can try to move it down below that level. Okay, so on the budget approach, we're going to be looking at exposure change. So are there major changes in employee count, payroll count, number of autos, um, property replacement costs? We're also going to then look at the claim trends in that first quarter of 2022 to take a look and say, okay, what do the loss ratios look like? How much is being spent in claims compared to how much is being paid in premium? Okay, so this becomes a great talking point as we're talking with Kerma's underwriters, and this would be with Ashley and her team. Uh, so uh, lastly is the timeline on budget. We start that process in the coming 30 days, and it kind of rolls into the coming calendar year. Uh, Mike knows that we end up having conversations in February, March timeframe, and we do everything to try to be in sync with how the town and the school district operate with their budget. Okay, so uh, that's an important part. We're trying to help predict into the future, even though the insurance policies don't technically renew until next July. So a uh, little bit of an art, a little bit of science involved in there, a little bit of witchcraft, but uh, we generally get it pretty right. And uh, we work to try to refine those estimates as we make our way month to month. So that's a, just a little bit of a, a peek into the window of different types of risk management activities. And I'm gonna pause before I go to the second item to answer any questions you might have so far. All right. And we are good. 
All right, sounds All right. good. Sounds good. Well, and in as you know, anytime even away from these committee uh, sessions, if you have questions, funnel them through. Uh, it can be through Matt, it can be through Mike, or 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 whatnot. And I will work to get you those answers between the meeting. Okay. So the other item is property casualty market update, and it probably sounds like it's a little bit redundant with what I just said, um, but. When we think about property casualty insurance, so this is property, auto insurance, workers' compensation, and all those other ancillary lines, what we're doing is we're starting with a global view. We're really looking to say, okay, what's happening across the country? What are the primary insurance carriers doing that write coverage for towns and school districts? Then what we do is we focus more on Connecticut, okay? Because unlike some other states, Connecticut does not have tort cap protection. And in Connecticut, we also have some nuances in the public sector where there's a responsibility to cover workers' comp for volunteer firefighters. That's one item. And the second nuance is that you have law enforcement personnel that are not a separate agency. They're embedded inside the town and then the last one is you have towns and school districts that generally are part of the same entity. That's different than other states around the country. Um, and I have the luxury of working on the, uh, uh, with about 50 other people across USI around the country that work with public entity. And I'm part of a small leadership team. So we tend to talk about this type of thing all the time. Um, the overall marketplace continues to see some stress. It's in the auto insurance area because of some larger verdicts and some larger settlements um, related to negligent entrustment and social, social uh, inflation. We're seeing on the property insurance side, the reinsurers are still driving rate increases, not based on what's happening here in Connecticut, but based on the payouts they are making down south over in Texas because of windstorms, hailstorms, and out west because of wildfires. They're also taking a look still at the overall replacement cost levels on buildings. Because as we all know, material costs have shot up and labor costs continue to go up because of a shortage of labor. So we're being very careful right now to look at those types of things. Because as I mentioned, when we talked about the budget, if the exposure base goes up, even if you have a rate cap of say plus 3%, that if the exposure base, like the total insured values go up, that can lead to some premium increase and that premium increase can impact your budget. So we're trying to watch over all of what I would call these pricing levers, okay? Um, workers' compensation seems to be a relatively stable environment. Um, it's, you know, medical, Medical costs have been controlled pretty well. We're seeing slightly increased use of telemedicine, especially during this pandemic. Um, but it, it's an area that we have to continue to watch over, um, especially because with the school districts, as they are now in session, that exposure of paraprofessional claims, you know, the injuries that get sustained when dealing with sometimes special needs students and whatnot, um, it's one of those things that does happen. But as we go, you know, totally in person versus remote, we have to be careful of those types of exposures again. So um, the marketplace, you know, I, I do think that Kerma um, offers stability because they're writing most of these coverages all under one roof. We also think, um, based on what I know about Kerma, that they are in a stable environment because of, like I said, a reduction in claims during the COVID period. I also know that they've been able to negotiate their reinsurance contracts in a way that creates some stability. So uh, we're watching them. Uh, we're, we're you know in touch with the other programs such as Travelers, such as the Paragon program, the Glatfelter program, and some other ones. Uh, and I guess the last thing that I would say is, as we make our way year to year, one of the other projects that our team has is to take a, take a look and say, would some increased level of risk be appropriate on the workers' comp side, such as a large deductible or perhaps some type of self-insurance 
Um, it might be a way, as long as you're managing that exposure, to help reduce your total cost, which are claim costs, premium costs, and other types of costs. So that's one of those ones of stay tuned. We'll talk about it more in 2022. But the whole idea here is never go on autopilot and always try to look at your program and say, is a different model possibly better as long as we're maintaining good, solid management of risk? Okay, so that's a, a little bit of an update on what's happening in the market. Um, you probably can do some internet searches and say property casualty market update. You'll see a lot about this, um, but that's um, those are some of the areas that we wanted to highlight. Uh, when we get to November, I will give you more of an update on some other specific coverage areas and an update on the budget as well. I talked quick and talked a lot there and provided a lot <laughs> of content, so you must have some questions. Chris, this is uh, the mystery person, I guess. I guess my name never popped up. This is Bonnie Therrien, the interim town manager. Oh, hi, Bonnie. Uh, that's on. How are you? I'm great. I heard your name mentioned uh, within the past week and just uh, put a smile on my face. I know you're there. You go. You're a tremendous asset for, for Weathersfield. Well, thank you very much. I'm wondering, do you have a handle at all, um, being that I'm back after 12 years on heart, heart and hypertension cases and where we're at and how many, how many more we're liable for? Um, I believe the number has uh, gone down a little bit. Um, I don't have that in front of me right now, um, but I would be happy to provide an update for you um, before the next meeting. Uh, if that would be if that would be good yeah that would be fantastic yeah because we, we, um, uh, Bonnie, I have to, huh? Bonnie, it's Mike. sorry michael yep we have uh we only have one case that's really regularly active and it's it's a pretty low uh low cost it's just just some prescription activity uh, we've had in the last two or three years uh, a couple settlements that uh, we work with Kerma on those um, and coming to those decisions. And I think the list of employees and former employees that are eligible, if mm -hmm. you will, is uh, it's less than 15. I think it's less than 10. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Better than when I was there. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that um, in in I know there's at least one committee member here that might be saying, okay, heart and hypertension. What are we talking about here? I, I would simply boil it down to one. <laughs> someone's smiling, so they probably know who I'm uh, thinking about. Heart and hypertension is a benefit that falls outside of the workers' compensation system, and there is a statute in Connecticut that is written so that certain employees under certain qualifying conditions and after a certain or before a certain date, they may qualify for heart and hypertension benefits. Um, KERMA, as Mike alluded to, is assisting the town with, a, with you know, monitoring these claims and helping you know, with that process under what we would call a third party administrator relationship. So KERMA is not actually paying for any type of benefit but they are assisting. So for uh, one of the newer members of the committee, just a, a little bit of a summary about how that works. But um, thank you, Mike, for providing uh, Bonnie that summary. And, and Bonnie, again, um, between before the next meeting, I'll reconnect um, with Mike and uh, make sure that you have the information that you're looking for. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Okay. And, and Bonnie, now that I know who you are and why you're there, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you'll find this is a very uh, thorough committee with uh, usually lots of questions, but our agents of records seem to have anticipated all of our questions. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I used to go to, uh, it was funny though, when somebody said heart and hypertension, I went, oh my God, I completely forgot about it because <laughs> Connecticut's one of the only states who has it. So that's what threw me. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about this. Yeah, that, that, would be, uh, that would be something that falls under what we would call total cost of risk, right? 
Any yes. other questions? Yep. I'm sorry, go ahead, Bobby. No, 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 I was just agreeing with Chris, that's all. I'm good. Are there any other questions for Chris? No. Okay, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to other business. Is there any other business that the committee would like to discuss at this time? Michael, any thought on getting together uh, over the next few months on a live meeting? I know West Hartford is now going to no masks and a couple of other towns. Yeah, we have that out there. Oh. Was that recent? Yeah. Well, uh, let's just talk about that for a second. How do, how do the committee members and uh, uh, associate people feel about attending a live meeting back in the conference room or many years ago we used to meet? Anybody want to discuss that? Any thoughts about it? You can certainly wear a mask. I certainly do. This is Bonnie again. The only thing we want to make sure it's one for all and all for one, because yes. we can't do some public, some zoo, uh, Zoom, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the committee would really have to agree to make sure, okay, we'll our, we're all going to try public. And if the numbers get worse, we're going to have to go back to Zoom again. Yeah, this this is Paul Mead. My, uh, my position would be if we don't have our masks, we ought to go back to having meetings together. Uh, if you have to wear masks, my preference would be to be remote and not have to wear masks. Um, but that's that's my position. So. Uh, so just to, you need wasn't clear, clear to me anyway. You're okay if we wear masks? Is that what you said? No, no. My, my I don't I don't want to be wearing a mask. I think they they interfere with the ability to communicate with one another. Uh, my position is if we don't have to wear masks, we ought to be able to get together and, and ah, meet. Okay, okay. If uh, we are going to have to wear masks, i just as soon do it remotely like we're doing now. Okay. Uh, Polly, uh, Alex, your, your thoughts? I'll uh, second. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with, um, with meeting. Um, I've been at a couple of... Um, uh, meetings at uh, town halls. Matter of fact, I'm one at 7:30 there tonight, um, and I think that if people are properly, um, you know, taking the proper precautions, that's great. But I also think that probably it's a lot more convenient for everyone to um, to meet by Zoom. So um, I'd personally like to see us all get together. So I'm I would go either way. And Frank, it allows you to go to Florida as well. So. No, not going to Florida this year. Oh, no. Long story. Oh, no, uh, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll tell you in just a second, but Alex, your thought? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I like what Paul said. If, if you know we're able to meet without masks, I, I'm comfortable doing so. Um, okay. That would be fine. Okay. Uh, I'll contact uh, 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 Michael. How do we want to let our other two members know that? Shall I send something out to them? Yeah, why don't you why don't you pull the group, okay. uh, Frank? And as long as we decide a week or so before the next meeting, you know okay. that's plenty that's plenty of time for us to, to make arrangements. Uh, the committee, notwithstanding, then if if the non-committee members prefer to wear a mask, I'm okay with that. Uh, I would agree with you, Paul. If we're going to be live, then uh, we ought to be uh, converse and be able to converse. Yeah, and I would add something else, but this, but this is not a committee at which there's usually a whole lot of uh, public attendance. So yeah. having us remote is not really an issue uh, in terms of public access. Okay, as a point of order, Michael, do we need a, a motion on this after the discussion or not? No. Okay, then we will plan to meet on our next meeting, which is November 18th in the conference room adjacent to the uh, acting town manager's office. That's fine. Um, ho hopefully by November, we don't have to wear masks, but right now um, we do require masks in town hall uh, based on our numbers. But we have an emergency operation committee meeting every Friday. 
to review that with the uh, central health department. So stay tuned. Okay, so go ahead, Paul. Now, if I would make a suggestion, let's, let's plan, in, instead of planning on meeting in person, let's plan on meeting remotely unless the mask mandate is lifted. Does that yes. make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and uh, um, Claudia, either you or, or Michael can give us a heads up on that. Sure will. Okay. Good. Um, any other um, topics to discuss? Any other business to discuss by the committee members? No. Okay. Well, that, given that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. That would be uh, Paul and a second. 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 Okay. Your, your choice, Michael, Paul or Alex. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 We are so adjourned. Thank you all. I think it's one of our quickest meetings ever. But yep. uh, thank you all. No, have, awesome. a great, have a nice night. Have a great all week. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.